in the last supplication, which is after the Amida, which we haven't yet stepped out of the audience, and we ask God, Psach libi secho. Open my heart with your Torah. And your mitzvahs, my soul should pursue. I mentioned in the past that the Chavetz Chaim cites this a number of times in the name of Rav Chaim Vital that just as we have 240 positive commandments, we have 248 components to the Jewish soul. And each positive commandment, which is referred to as mitzvah, say the do mitzvahs, correspond to one component of the soul. And every mitzvah we do creates an energy, and that energy is a spiritual infusion to that soul. The essence of a person is his soul. That's the essence. Person dies, the body remains intact. But once the soul departs, the person's life, life ends. If the soul is sufficiently, so what facilitates the objective of the soul, which has to do with the intellect? It's the soul. Without it, the body, the soul cannot in any way function within the context of challenges. When you challenge, you only challenge because you're a physical being. You have to make choices. So if you utilize the physicality of the human being to make the right choice, the body is the object or is the means is the facilitator that facilitates the spirituality of the soul and causes that infusion. You put on tefillin in the morning. So tefillin, let's say, corresponds to the part of the soul that corresponds to the hand or the heart. So when you put on that tefillin of the hand on your arm and you put it on correctly and you meet all the criteria of what tefillin is, that's considered a valid peer, kosher pair of tefillin and you understand its value that creates that level of infusion. So the hand is the object that's that's utilized to pro provide that infusion. As a result of that, the more the body is involved in the spiritual process, the body and soul actually link more strongly and the physicality of the person assumes a sense of spirituality, the value of spirituality. A person doesn't engage in any spirituality you live just purely as an intellectual animal. So your whole function and your whole emphasis and direction is purely physical. So you draw on your physical senses and you limit it to your physical senses because the spirituality, the soul has no relevance to the actually perspective and the investment of the physicality. If the physicality is to earn and provide comfort to one's life, it begins and ends with that. What relevance does that have to do with the soul? Nothing. The soul is purely the source of its, the life of the person. But in terms of this make of the soul, being a spiritual entity has nothing to do with the person's lifestyle or behavior or understanding of anything. So the physicality is totally detached from the physicality of the soul. But if the body itself conforms to its value is to provide and facilitate the spiritual infusions which the soul needs that it should be part of eternity then the physicality assumes a certain spiritual persona or sense and therefore you gravitate towards that because you've actually meshed the soul and the body where the soul is actually acting as the agent of the soul to provide that infusion and advance it continuously But again, what is fundamental to be able to make those decisions and beat those challenges? The study of Torah. We say, person is an ignoramus. No, nothing, not faulting him. 
He was brought up not even knowing he's Jewish. He was brought up without a Jewish education. He has no orientation whatsoever. So although he's not being faulted for not living as a Jew, because he doesn't even know what that means, but factually speaking, he purely lives as a physical being, as an intellectual being, because he's not drawing on the the capability of the soul in terms of intermingling, meshing it with his, with his physical life. Therefore, that person will never have a sense of spirituality because the physical aspects of his being is invested purely in a physical investment, in a material investment, which is the pleasures of life, the ego, and everything that goes along with that. And maybe for altruistic reasons, doesn't make a difference, but it's not the spirituality that the Jew was meant to live for. Therefore, the body is not spiritualized. Therefore, the spiritual senses are not activated or developed. Therefore, the person doesn't pursue anything which has to do with God's word, which is the Torah itself, which is the 248 positive commandments or the 365 negative commandments. There's a response that was written in the early 1800s by the Chassam Sofer. He was a leading Torah decisor lived in Czechoslovakia, Hungary. His name was Ramosha Schreiber, Ramosha Sofer. And the question was this, somebody had written a question, the law is although a child, a minor who eats non-kosher or violates the Torah, there's no level of culpability or liability because the child, until you become an adult, you're not held accountable for your behavior at all. But once you reach puberty and age, you become a responsible member of the Jewish people and you're held accountable for your actions. So, but even though a child, if he chooses to eat not kosher, you have no obligation to intervene to prevent him from eating not kosher because factually he's not in violation of a law. But nevertheless, I mean, it's, it's the right thing to do, but you, you haven't violated anything by not intervening to prevent that minor, whether it's a boy or a girl, from eating the not kosher, from not observing the Shabbos. But if you do make a difference in the positive, you're credited for that person's development in terms of his Judaism. But everybody agrees, and there's a Torah violation, although if the child, on his, through his own volition, chooses not to observe any of the laws of the Torah, there's no accountability to that child. However, what about if the, an adult wants to feed that child not kosher? You know, the child could eat a kosher sandwich and not kosher. And you go and say, look, if the child will want to buy the uh, hamburger himself, he can. So, you know, something, I'll buy it, I'll provide it. If an adult provides it, the adult is in violation of the Torah. Although the child, if he chooses... He's not in violation, nobody's a violation. But if an adult is the cause of his eating non-kosher, because you feed him non-kosher, the adult has liability. You're not permitted a Torah violation, okay? So what was the discussion? There was a child that he had certain deficiency and ultimately because of this deficiency, it would lead to retardation. That was the story. And the only way we'd be able to stop that deterioration, mental deterioration, you have to be committed to a certain kind of hospital. And that hospital, they have a certain level of diet. They feed the child, which is a non-kosher diet. And part of the therapy is to feed the child non-kosher. Non-kosher species, milk and meat cooked together, which are all not permitted on a Torah level. So the question is, putting that child into that institution is it the equivalent of feeding the child not kosher. Of course, it's inevitable putting him in that institution, he will be eating not kosher. So is that the equivalent of you feeding the child not kosher? That was the question posed to the Hassam Sofer. Okay? So he writes that it's not the equivalent of feeding the child on kosher. It's not. If you put that child into that institution to pre prevent this retardation 
and he's able to maintain himself or even advance mentally, you're not in violation. However, he's, this is what he says. He says that the Rambam writes in Mur and the Vuchim in Guide for the Perplexed, where he gives reasons, rational reasons for every one of the positive and negative commandments. And he says, it's a known fact. The Torah tells us that when, if a person does not observe kosher and he eats non-kosher species, the Torah says, alludes to this, that it shuts down one's spiritual system. Totally shuts down, your spirit, that you have no capacity to relate to anything spiritual if you don't observe dietary laws. We're speaking specifically non-kosher species. Because the Torah says, if you eat non-kosher species, you will become contaminated through them. And contaminated means spiritual contamination. However, the way the Torah spells the word, you become contamination, contaminated because the Aleph is deleted from the word. It could be read, you'll be shut down. Spiritually, you'll be sealed, you'll be closed. Closed to anything spiritual. Therefore, Rambam writes that since a consequence of eating non-kosher is your spiritual system is shut down and becomes inoperative and you have no sense of spirituality, Therefore, he says, all issues of heretical issues, having difficulty believing in God, despite the irrefutable proofs that there is a God, whatever it may be, the blockage is, is because the person does not observe dietary laws. The dietary laws is the cause that the person does not have the capacity to appreciate and internalize certain beliefs. That's the block. That's the blockage. That's what he writes. So this is what he writes. Although you're permitted to put this child into this institution, but be, and it's not considered you're feeding the child, but since the child is going to get a very serious dose over a number of years, till he becomes an adult of non-kosher, ultimately, when he becomes an adult, he'll be a denier of God's existence. Because of this very serious infusion of non-kosher food, so he writes to Chassam Sofer, it's better that he should die an innocent Jew than die a Jew who's culpable for all his denial of God. That's his ruling. There's no permission putting him in the institution. It's not. But he says, but you have to see the end product. The end product is you can have a Jew who's alive, who's functional, but his beliefs will be alien beliefs, everything contrary to God's existence. So you have a choice. You have no obligation to put him in the institution. You're permitted to put him in the institution. But the end result will be, he will be a Jew who will have no capacity to process spirituality at any level. That's what it is. So let's say you have a Jew, observes dietary laws. He has the potential, he has the capacity. But what really fuels it? What drives it? What puts the inclination at bay. That's the study of Torah. We ask God, open our hearts with the Torah, that we should study it and be touched by it to its maximum. As a result of that, our natural inclinations will be put at bay. And as a result of that, the Torah will impact us and create that energy and we'll have a sense of our spirituality. Therefore, our souls will pursue mitzvos. We're going to pursue doing mitzvos. You won't feel it's a burden, but rather you will gravitate towards them because you have a sense of your spirituality. And as much as you have, you want to continuously grow it and advance it for that reason. So that's the request we make over here. Open our hearts with your Torah. The heart is the organ of the body it has to do with feeling, emotion. The t Torah should touch our hearts. And once your heart is touched, it's something you want. And once you want that, you want to be open to spirituality, and it's interesting. The Talmud tells us, or the Mishnah, Talmud Torah can get kulam. The Torah is one mitzvah, but it's the equivalent of all the mitzvahs combined. Meaning, the energy that Torah generates is the energy of every one of the mitzvahs. 
whether it's observing of observance of Shabbos, eating kosher, the holidays, tefillin, tzitzis, everything. That's all included within the energy of Torah. It's the equivalent of everything. It's the all encompassing. So what happens is when you touch it, it's spiritualized. It spiritualized every one of the components of your soul. As a result of that, now you have the capacity to have a sense to internalize the value of every mitzvah. And because you have that sense, you pursue every mitzvah. Any mitzvah opportunity that presents itself, now you want to pursue it. I once told a story not long ago that many years ago I met a rabbi. He was more than a rabbi. He was a great, he was a brother of Rebel Yoshif, and he was the son of Rabbi Ari Levin, famous Sadiq of Yushalayim, Rabbi Ari Levin. He was the rabbi of all the, the War of Independence of Israel, all the ones who fought in that War of Independence to drive the British out of, out of Palestine, he was their rabbi. And he would visit them in prison and he would give them a sense of their value and their purpose and their cause. So he had a son, his name was Rebbe Fo Levin. And he was a special tzaddik, not quite his father. His father was exceptional. His father was the father of Rebbe Yoshif. And I met him many years ago, and he told me a story about his father. His father, Shabbos, although he wasn't a Hasidic Jew, but the custom of the old Yushalmi community, Jerusalem family community was, they wore a special dress on Shabbos. What was the garb, the attire? They would wear what we call a strangle, a fur hat, although they were not Hasidim. So he was walking with his father in the old city when the old city was really, the Arabs controlled the old city. And he's walking in the street with his father. His father's wearing the shrine. His father's an elderly Jew. And he's younger. He's wearing a shrine also. And a person approaches them. And he's smoking a cigarette on Shabbos. And he says to them, could you... Tell me exactly how do I get to the Lebanon Hotel. Hotel Lebanon. Lebanon Hotel. Okay? And he spoke in Hebrew to them. Although he was not original Israeli, he spoke with an English, British accent, but he spoke to them in Hebrew. How do I get to Malon Lebanon? That was the question I asked him. The Lebanon Hotel. And he smoked a cigarette. And he's a chain smoker. Like he used to smoke in the old days. You know, you, play, you smoke players or, you know, uh, camels. No, 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 no filters. One to the other, just keep lighting one after he's walking with them. So Rabbi Ari Levin says to him, he says, you know something? Let me walk with you. I'll show you exactly how to get to the hotel. And he was an elderly man. And it took him about 20 minutes to walk with him. And he sh- walked with him the full direction. Didn't speak to him at all. And treated him anything he inquired, he responded. And finally they come to the destination, he says, this is the Lebanon Hotel, okay? And the person must have been 30 years old, this chain smoker on Shabbos, and he knows knows the rabbi, doesn't approve of his smoking on Shabbos, but the rabbi didn't say a word to him, not a word. And they come to the Lebanon Hotel, so this Jew who was smoking says to the rabbi, he says, I want to tell you something, Rabbi. I promise you, I will never again smoke on Shabbos. And he takes the cigarette, and in those days they referred to it, and he threw it into the gutter. Threw it into the gutter, the cigarette. He says, I promise you, I will never smoke again. So the Rabbi says to him, I never discussed with you whether you're permitted to smoke, whether you're not permitted to smoke. I never said a word to you. So what touched you in a way that you're not going to smoke? that you're swearing it off, never again. He says, I'll I'll explain to you. I asked you for directions to the Lebanon Hotel. You could have said, go three blocks east, then go left and go so many blocks north and this and that, and you'll arrive. But you went and took up your time and you walked with me 
It showed me your concern for me to make sure that I arrive and put yourself out for me. You're a special Jew. And because you're so special and I know it's something you wouldn't want me to do, therefore I swear I will never again smoke on Shabbos. That's what he said to him. So Rabbi Levin, the son said to me, Rafa says, but you see, you don't have to rebuke people. You don't have to admonish them. But if you treat them and show them that you're concerned about them, they will gravitate to you. And even without explaining to them, knowing who you are, they would want to satisfy what you would want. That's what it's what, that's what the son said to me. So you see, you don't have to rebuke people. You don't have to admonish people. Okay. So I said to him, I said to the son, I said, you know something, not so simple. So factually, I said to him, when I teach, I never tell people what they're not permitted to do. I teach them what they're supposed to do. And because they have enough appreciation what they're supposed to do and they see its value, they understand what they're not supposed to do. That's the best approach. Teach them the right and from knowing the right and appreciating right, they'll know not to do the wrong. Rather than telling them not to do the wrong when they don't understand why it's so wrong. That's the best approach. But I said to him, I said, the takeaway that you take away from your father is not necessarily accurate. Why? Because your father was a holy man and he had, he exuded a certain aura and warmth and feeling. This person was touched by that. But an ordinary Jew, even if he's a law-abiding citizen, he doesn't have that presence that your father had. So sometimes, unless you tell the person he's doing the right thing, the wrong thing, it doesn't transmit. I said, therefore, there's no, there's no, there's no comparison that other people are the equivalent and they're able to accomplish the same thing without, without saying anything. I said, I'll give you an example. The Talmud tells us there were three non-Jews who came to Shammai. Shammai was the contemporary of Hillel. And they wanted to convert to Judaism. And Shammai had a totally different personality, different approach. And they said, we'll convert to Judaism on one condition. One condition, and they give Shammai an ultimatum. You do this, we convert. Shami says, no, don't waste my time. Just leave. And it says he drove them out. You know, we're not looking for converts. You want to convert? Let's talk. You give me preconditions. I have no time to waste. It says he drove them out. They come to Hillel. And Hillel hears what they say. One says, I want, I'll convert on the condition I can be the high priest. The high priest. So he says to the person, he says, you know, King David, who's the most special king of the Jewish people, if King David would do the service of the high priest, he's liable for spiritual excision. So King David, the greatest Jew ever lived, is not qualified. You want to be qualified? That's what Hill says to him. He says, I didn't realize that. I'm happy to be an ordinary Jew like King David. He says, fine. So he converted him rather than driving him out. Another one says, how do I know that, that the Torah is really true? How do I know that there's really truth to it, that its source is divine? He says, you know something, before I give you answers, let's give, let me give you a first lesson. Let me give you the first lesson. I'm gonna teach you the Hebrew alphabet. The first four letters, Aleph, Beis, Gimel, Dalit, okay? He says, you know, go home, do your homework, review it. Tomorrow I'll give you the second lesson. Comes back the next day, he says, okay, we're gonna I'm gonna review with what I taught you yesterday. Dalit Gimel Beis Aleph. He says it backwards. So the Gentile says to Hillel, he says, but yesterday you taught me it's Aleph Beis Gimel Dalit. That was the order. The sequential, now you tell me it's backwards. So Hillel says, you get the answer. He, he, he learned the lesson well. Our religion is based on tradition. It's transmitted. The true basis for the truth of our religion is it's the transmission. He says, you know something? Terrific. I can, I'm converting to Judaism. That's it. So I said to this Rabbi Levin, I said, if we play that game on somebody, you first you teach him, then you invert the order backwards. Do you think he's going to be impressed with it? He says, what are you wasting my time? What do you think I'm a child? Do you think I have a 15 IQ? What are you playing games with me? But yet when Hill said it, somehow it resonated. It touched him like a bolt of lightning. You know what the answer is? Because Hillel, the Talmud tells us, was so humble and so great 
that the Torah wouldn't have been given to, through Moshe Rabbeinu, Hillel was qualified to receive the Torah on behalf of the Jewish people only because the generation wasn't worthy. That's why he couldn't receive the Torah. So what level did Hillel exude? What aura did he have? So when a man like Hillel says, al gimel dalet, it's like once hearing God speaking from Sinai, saying, I am God who took you out of Egypt. Same thing. Your father was not an ordinary man. He was a holy man, his father. You read, there's a book, you could buy it. It's called a, 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 a Tzaddik in, of Jerusalem. And you read about his father just a little bit. You understand what he was. The man lived like an angel. And he, there was nobody he didn't accommodate for whatever the need was. So when that man speaks, as they used to say years ago, when E.F. Hutton speaks Lahabdil, people listen. That's the way it works. Someday, when the sheikh speaks, the world's going to listen. We should marry these, should come real very soon to have that privilege. Open our hearts with your Torah. You can have the best teacher in the world. You can meet the most special person. If your heart is closed, Rabbi, I have no time. I'm not impressed. And maybe, you know, you're a nice man. I'll give you a few dollars. But you know something? You're not my cup of tea. It's not for me. So the rabbi tries to convince, but you're a Jew, so on and so forth. But it's not for me. What am I supposed to tell you? It doesn't resonate. But every Jew has a capacity. It should resonate. But what do you have to do? His heart has to be opened. Therefore, we pray to God. Even if we're observant Jews, we know that we're able to advance endlessly to greater heights. So what's, what's preventing it? Because we don't sense it. We don't feel it. But if God would open our hearts with the Torah, even the Torah we study, if we would open it, then we'd have a sense of the value. And we'd realize there's no greater opportunity than what, whatever that may be. And then we pursue mitzvahs. Because that's what life's all about. And we realize that's what life's all about. The Ramchal writes that after Mashiach comes, all evil will be purged based on verses. There's not going to be any evil in existence. So how are we, how are we going to occupy our times? After Mashiach comes, you realize the buildings are going to be the same buildings. The physical world is the same world. Same world. And we rule this way. So what's going to change? What's going to change is the priority of man. Where do we put our eggs in which basket? Our energies, our intellect, where do we invest it? So he explains the Ramchal that every Jew, now that he has clarity, he has no blockage any longer. And all the spiritual senses are working at 100% capacity. And he fully is able to internalize the infinite value of every mitzvah. He will study. Torah, unceasingly, 24 hours a day, other than the time he has to sleep. And he has to take out time to eat. Because that is what it's about. It's, there'll be a, such an absolute level of understanding of its value. It's something you can't stop. Of course, you understand, time's of the essence. And time is limited. And this is how we say, King Solomon says, I've given you a commodity which is nothing comparable to that. Don't abandon it. Warren Buffett says, he gives you his stock. And he says, I'm giving it to you. Regardless of money you need, never sell that stock. Hold on for the next 10 years. Because if you do, you'll be the luckiest guy in the world. And if you need a little money on the side, as long as I'll lend it to you. The person hears and appreciates, because if he tells you this, Warren Buffett, you, you know that advice is sound advice. And you challenge, you need the money. If you sell it off, you can change your life. The words of, of Buffett 
continuously rings in your ears. You don't sell that stock because Buffett is credible. He knows what he's talking about. He's the expert. Shalom King Solomon says, Ki tov luchem. The wisest man who ever lived. There's nothing more precious and infinitely valuable than the Torah itself. Don't abandon that, not for a second. But unfortunately, we're not going to realize that reality until Mashiach comes. We're all evil will be purged. But by then, you no longer have choice. So that that you're going to gravitate toward that is not because you've chosen, but rather because that's become the reality of every human being, of every Jew. To be fully, it's like a magnetic force. We can't restrain ourselves. It's like a person has to breathe. You can only hold your breath so long. And anybody who functions as a healthy human being, there's no reason why you should hold your breath. And you breathe deeply. And the oxygen goes in your lungs and it actually oxygenates your blood. And you become fully functional. That's what's going to happen after come Mashiach. And what I'm telling you now is infinitesimal reality compared to what's going to be, which I myself, can't, we can't even relate to what's going to be. Because we, doesn't, we don't even know what it means not to be touched by desire and not having to suppress inclinations, which we know are inappropriate inclinations. But at least now, which is a semblance of that, we have a mechanism. It's called Torah. Torah is the antidote. But even if we use that as an antidote, it has to be infused with an intent. You do it selflessly without any ulterior motive. Then the Torah will open your heart. And when he opens your heart, what's going to happen? And as we read at the end of Oval Zion, put your love and your reverence in my heart to do your service with a full heart in the most complete way. If you touch with Torah in that level, you'll pursue the Torah. You'll pursue the mitzvahs. You will leave no stone unturned to do the will of God. We find by Avram Avinu, the founding patriarch of the Jewish people, it was the third day after he was circumcised. He's 99 years old. It's the hottest day of existence. Wayfarers are not coming for hospitality. He's beside himself. 99, he's looking every direction. Where are they? And he's pained. He can't do hospitality. He can't bring mankind back to monotheism. You understand? What was his drive? Avram Avin had a drive that it's not to be to relate to what kind of drive he had, the spirituality. He's taking his son to the Akeda to be slaughtered. His son, who's 37 years old, is the future of existence. God says, bring him up as a sacrifice. He's confronted with a raging river. And he's drowning. And this is Satan because Satan doesn't want him to, to succeed with this challenge. He ra raises his eyes to God, to heaven, and says, God, I want to do your will. You're not allowing me to do your will. It would be any one of us. We did our best. We're going home. And we're going to celebrate that you're still alive. That's what we would have done. It. That's not Avram. Avram says, if that's your will, no matter what, I want to do your will. But you, you're going to slaughter your son. How could you be so eager and driven to do it? God, if that's your will, that's where I am. What I feel, what I understand is irrelevant. All that matters is you. That was Avram's commitment to the will of God. He was drawn to it more than a magnetic force. So we pray to God, open our hearts with your Torah that we should naturally be driven to do your mitzvahs, to do your commandments, to do your will. Now there's an expression in English, half baked. People, they do things half baked. Person comes davening, 10 minutes before it's over. And uh, puts on a pair of tefillin real quickly. Fixes the straps a little bit. The show roach is off to the side. The show yad is, is below his elbow. And uh, he puts the talus on his shoulders. He falls up about four times before the 10 minutes are over. And his fellow has to pick it up, put it on his shoulder. And uh, now he's ready for breakfast as soon as they finished. 
because he says it's Kaddish for his father's yard site. Okay. Is that the way you put on tefillin? Is that the way you put on a talus? Is that the way you pray? The word half baked is an understatement. It's a disgrace. And we're talking about a person who went to Jewish day school or even went to yeshiva as a child. He knows better. He doesn't value it. It's not that important to him. I do it out of respect for my father. It's, you know, I go to, he goes to the cemetery every year, looks at that tombstone. But now, you know, with remote and COVID, he doesn't even have to go to the cemetery. They have cameras set up at the cemetery when he sits and he has his 25 foot TV in his uh, theater at home, he could see the cemetery. He just has to program it that the camera sh shows, shines on the, the monument of his father on the tombstone. So he, can, he doesn't have to go out there. And he has a recording of Kel Mole, the Kel Mole they say from, from his home. Doesn't have to do more than that. You understand what's going on over here? It's, 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 you could almost set up a comedy hour with this kind of thing. That's what it is. So how do you really know it's the real thing? Open my heart with your Torah. The heart knows and has a sense of what's right and what's wrong. If the heart is fully in operation. And if that happens, I will pursue your mitzvahs like nobody's business. With an eagerness, with an energy, with a drive, with a passion. And that's what we pray for. And if we really mean what you're saying and you're sincere, God will not fall, God forbid, on deaf ears, but rather God will give you that ability and that assistant, assistance to be able to achieve that level.